I want to say something, then I want to do something. How many got to watch, uh, Brother Bruce, go ahead and bring me down just a little bit, please. How many got to watch some of the 9-11 stuff yesterday? I don't know about you, but I, I found my emotions all over the map. I found myself crying. Found myself angry. Found myself crying. Found myself angry. All over the map. I also heard a, I believe it was a veteran that was talking, and he was talking about when he got into the military, how that the military has always had a mantra, no man left behind. We don't leave them behind. They go down in war, we go get them. Now, I don't mind telling you, if you don't know, I'm a very conservative person. So if you're waiting for a liberal speech, you have got the wrong place. They played one of the speeches of President Bush. One of his speeches, here's what he said, after the 9-11 attack, and I paraphrase now, he said, we will be going in, there are no negotiations, you will not tell us when we're going to leave, we will tell you when we're going to leave. We're America. And then one of the veterans came on yesterday and he said, our mantra was, no man left behind. He said, in the last few weeks, our administration needs to go back and learn some history because we are doing directly the opposite. I want to do something. And I thank my brother for bringing this to my attention. I'm going to ask, uh, have I got any Marines in the building serving the Marine Corps? Navy? Army? Coast Guard? Air Force? So it looks like we're missing the Air Force and the Marines. <laughs> well, we need them both. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, if you served, if you served, I'm going to ask you, man or woman, I don't care. Please notice I did say man or woman. If you're not one of them, come to me after service and I'll clarify that for you. <laughs> Years ago, you wouldn't even say that because it was not, not even a topic. served in the service of our country, National Guard. I forgot that, I'm sorry. I'm gonna ask if you will to come and stand across this front. Please come and stand across this front. Grab that microphone. And Leon, you come up here. Just remain standing if you can. If you can, I understand, but if you can, please remain standing. We have Americans right now that are wondering if they're gonna live or die. That are wondering if tomorrow their head is going to be attached to their body, and that is the truth. You're dealing with people over there that are abs, if, I've, I've, if I've ever seen demonic people they are there. You have them right now. I don't care what our blessed president is saying or what the puppeteers are saying. I'm telling you right now, 
They can declare victory all they want, but we have got Americans that are hiding out in Afghanistan right now trying to figure out if they're going to live or they're going to die. I've asked Leon, he served in the army. He's one of our prayer warriors around here. I've asked him to come, not only to pray over those souls that are in Afghanistan waiting to be delivered, but I've also asked him to pray over our veterans to help us never forget that without our vets, you and I would not be here today. Brother Leon, would you please ask God to touch those that need deliverance in Afghanistan and also over our vets today, please. Our Heavenly Father, we just humbly come before you. You're an awesome God. And there are things in this world that are going on that we don't understand. But there are people that are hurting in another country, Afghanistan. We thank you, Father, for your love for them. But we also thank you that there is a way out when our people in America find that answer to do what we're supposed to be doing is getting them out. Father, we pray right now that you would just touch those people yes. that have been left behind because there is fear, there is anxiety, there is an unknown that they do not know about. Father, I pray right now that you'd put the peace of Jesus, wrap your arms around them, Father, because you are a God that cares. Wherever they are, you are there with them. Father, I pray right now that you would just touch them and give them the answers that they need and the decisions that need to be done by Thank our Jesus. country to do something brave and forthright that we should have done months ago. Father, I pray that you just put your blessings on our country that we may be a source of renewal to those people that are lost over there. Father, I pray for each veteran that has lost a leg, an arm, or PTSD, Father, because of the war. We pray right now that you would just touch the, each of those lives that have been able to serve for our country. We thank you, Father, for the presence of your love right now. We pray right now that the, each one in our congregation that served in the, in the service under Army, Navy, or whatever, that you would just be thankful for them that volunteered to be a winner of you. We thank you, Father, for your love and your compassion. We thank you, Father, that we can call upon your name because you are our source. You are our supply. And we give you praise and honor for that. So we say thank you for each you, veteran that has served his duty in, in another land and come back. Father, because of who you are, we can say thank you for what you've done thank for you, us. Lord. In your precious name, amen. We've got flags all over this. Would you please join me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I don't know about you, but I am still proud to be an American. These six that are up here right now represent a whole lot of people in our church. Would you let our veterans know we are so proud of them? Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We started about three weeks ago a series entitled, What Drives Your Life? What pushes you forward? What makes you tick? What gets you from square uh, one to square two to square three to the end of the journey? We're going to finish that today. 
Uh, I am, I'm trusting that I can do what it is that I feel like I need to do, which is a whole lot of teaching today and a little less preaching today, which is so difficult for me. Uh, I also would encourage you today, if you have a pen, if you have a, a pencil, uh, there is so many things in here today, it would be worth your while to write down. Uh, I, know, I know I am serving uh, intelligent geniuses out here, and you probably don't need any of that, but just in case you have a little glitch in your head and you don't, for, you don't remember something, that if you have it written down, it could help you, okay? So if you get an opportunity, you might want to write a few things down today. We, uh, uh, we'll get into to it and more. So the big thought for the day, here it is. Ready? Materialism. How much land does a man need? How much land does a man need? Again, started a series about three weeks ago. We'll finish it today. Let me quickly, quickly recap where we were at. The very first week, if you remember, we talked about guilt. That guilt will cause you to live in the past, never move on to your God-given future. Paul said this, and it was so rich. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and moving on ahead. Amen? And then the second thing we talked about was resentment and anger. Resentment and anger. Now, I know many people, when somebody hurts you, they say something to you, you want to get even with them, you want to get back. Let me share with you the best way to get even with somebody. Are you curious about that? Here's the best way to get even with somebody. One of the greatest ways, when somebody hurts you, forgive them and move on with your life. It's the best way to get even with somebody. Because people that have hurt you want you to continue to be hurt. And when you strike out at them or you cuss them out, no, you don't do that because you're Christians. When you, when you say something negative towards them, they absolutely love it because they are getting even more under your skin. So the best way that you get even with somebody is to forgive them and move on with your life. Amen. Number three, we talked about it last week. And that's fear. It will keep you imprisoned and will keep you from meeting your full potential. Potential. Fear will cause you not to go out of the house. Fear will cause you to move backwards when you need to move forward. Fear will trap you in a trap of anxiety. Fear will destroy your life. There are some people, not, not many, not many. There are some people that literally aren't at church today. Some aren't here because they're getting over COVID. Some aren't here because they're on vacation. Some aren't here because of whatever. But there literally are people that don't come anymore because of fear. Fear causes you to stop living. Does anybody here like to go out and eat? I mean, I like to go out to eat. Anybody like to go out? Four of us? Five of us? Oh, now we're getting honest. Okay. We all like to go out to eat. What do you like to eat when you go out? What's your favorite food? Steak. Steak. What else? Steak. Mexican. What else? Pizza. Chinese. What else? Why did I just do that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really am. That was uncalled for. What else? What, get me out of this hole. What else? What else? Thai food. Thai food. Cajun. How about Cajun? Hey, we live in Louisiana, buddy. I'm telling you, those people know how to cook back there. What else? What else? Barbecue. What else? Huh? Okay, now, for you that like to go out to eat, and you're at home, does both husband and wife, or just husband or just wife, know how to cook? Okay, is there anybody here that would admit that you live in a home where you're both not the best cooks in the world? Okay, all right. So, fear causes you to eat your own cooking. That can be dangerous. All right? So, fear keeps you at home instead of going out and enjoying your life. This last year and a half, going on two years, that's where America has been. 
We have been afraid to go out. We have been afraid to talk to somebody. We've been afraid to talk to our grandchildren. We've had to sit behind a window and wave at everybody. Fear will keep you in a cocoon and sooner or later it will destroy your life. All right? Father, for the next few moments, as always, I need your help. I don't ever come up here behind this desk on this platform thinking I can do this by myself. I learned a long time ago, when I try to do that, I fail. I need you today. I need you to not only help me, but I need you to open up the ears of the listeners. I don't need them just to hear words today. I need them to hear your spirit and the meaning behind the words today. I need you to do in their lives what no other person can do. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Here we go. Number four, last one. Many people are driven by materialism. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse number 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse number 10. Here's what it says. Whoever loves money never has enough money. Can somebody say amen? Let me just say that again. Whoever loves money never has enough money. I didn't say it's, it's bad to have money. Hey, I tried it both ways. I, having a little money is a lot better than not having no money at all, Okay. But whoever loves money will never have enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Here's an interesting statement. Whoever loves or puts all their faith in money, watch this, please, guys, please get this. Whoever loves or puts all their faith in money will depend totally on money itself. This means that their total existence is based upon the inconsistency of our unstable economy at best. Yeah, that really is an oh me thing. That's whoo. Let me, just sh let me share that last part with you again. This means that their total existence is based upon the inconsistency of our unstable economy at best. And don't tell me we don't, don't even try to make me believe that our economy is not unstable. Don't come to me with this doctrine that has been preached to us that the middle class is not going to be taxed and the middle class is not going to be hurt with all of this foolishness that is now being put in to our administration's hands. I can tell you this, middle class, and I am one of them, I may not have bigger taxes, but I now pay more in my gas, more for my food, more for housing. I can continue to go on and on and on. So when somebody tells you that you're you're not going to be hurt. You better get ready for a knife in your back. Well, you're getting political. You are darn right I'm getting political. And I'm about had enough of this stuff. We, our total existence is based upon the inconsistency of our unstable economy at best. Wall Street goes up, 401ks go up. Man, we're happy, aren't we? Woo! -hoo! Wall Street goes down, 401ks go down. Now we're miserable. You get a raise, woo! There's a cutback and your income goes down or you get fired or laid off. The world has come to an end. It's almost like God, the God that you serve, dictates how good he is, you think, by our economy. Hey, I got news for you. Whether the economy is up or whether the economy is down, the Bible said I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. My God in heaven, God will take care of his people. Back to teaching. <laughs> Their love for money and the unquenchable desire to obtain more is never satisfied. He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver. The more he gets, the more he wants. The love of money or mental dependency for money 
increases in proportion as money itself increases. Now, what do you mean by that, preacher? Here's what I mean. The more you get, the more you want. The more you get, the more you want. This is where some of these preachers just tick me off. They forget where they come from. These preachers in these, I don't have a problem with the mega church. I wish our church was the mega church. But you got some of these preachers in these mega churches that they started with two people. They started in an old shack somewhere and just started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then God blessed them. And 20 years later, they got to have a Bentley. They got to drive a Rolls Royce. They got to buy a $10 million airplane. And call it. God, while thousands of people are dying because they're starving to death. Okay, right. That's why, to keep things in perspective, we've got to seek after the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. Here is a mindset of the kingdom of heaven. You ready for this? This will help you. Here's the mindset of heaven. You find it in Matthew's gospel, chapter 6, start reading verse number 25. It says, therefore I say unto you, do not worry about life. Some of you guys need to chill out. Stop stressing so much. What are you going to eat? What am I going to drink? What about your body? What, what am I going to put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? I got to tell you this, and this is dangerous for me to tell this, but I'm going I'm to do it anyway. I've, you know, I'm one of these guys that, you know, good thoughts should never be wasted. And so I, I, as, as I was, and, and Lisa walks in just as I'm going to tell this. <laughs> well, we're going to move right on. Uh, so so I, I got a wife. I, I raised a couple girls. And over the years, I, there's, there's, this, there's this thing that I hear coming out of the women in my house. It's always confused me. And I must say that, it's always confused me. And here's what I hear from all the rooms. I don't have anything to wear! Now that always struck me a little bit weird. Because I want my wife, I want my children to have clothes. I don't want them walking out naked. You know what I'm saying? I want them to have clothes. And so I got worried that maybe they have no clothes. So I walk into Lisa's closet. I go to the other girls' closets. And lo and behold, you can't put any more clothes in that thing. So I'm thinking to myself, it must mean something different than what I'm thinking. When my girls got dressed... You realize that you could go in and have a cup of coffee, a piece of pie, and maybe even cook a steak by the time they're ready to go. When I'm ready to go, start the car. I'll probably be there before you're there. Because I got plenty of clothes. I ain't got to search for them. I just pick them out. Unfortunately for my girls, I do pick them out. You have no idea how many times that I've walked into this church and I looked over at Lacey and she goes, oh God, no, play down it. Now does this verse mean that we shouldn't care about what we wear, not care about our investments, or not care about, no, it doesn't mean that at all. The meaning here is that we are to take no anxious thought or literally take no worry. The word worry here, this is good, guys. The word worry here literally means to strangle. What that means is this. When you start to worry about things, when you start to fret about things, or anxiety takes you over, it's as if the devil himself takes his hand, puts your 
his hand around your throat and begins to crush your throat so that you cannot breathe anymore. That's what anxiety and stress and worry does. So there has to come a place in your life, Barbara, where you finally say, I am no longer going to be stressed or worry. God, I'm going to give it to you. And when you give it to God and faith steps in, the hand of the enemy has to come off of your throat and you realize I am in the hands of God and what's happening is the best for my life. But God, this isn't the way I wanted it to work. And you need to say, thank God, because he knows tomorrow and you do not. Sometimes if we had our way, we would have already been demolished. But God cuts that off of the past. And he says, I'm going to help you and I'm going to bless you. But I want to take you in the right route to get you where it is you need to go. Mm. Verse number 26, looked at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than the birds? Which of you by worrying can add one minute to his life? Has your anxiety, are you worried? Has, your worry, has it ever helped you? I mean, is it ever like, you know, you just felt better after you was all stressed out? So why don't you worry about, why do you worry about clothing? Why do you consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow, they don't toil or spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is here, tomorrow is gone, will he not much more clothe you, ladies? Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. It's not in there. I, I'm sorry. It's not. I don't. It's not. You know, it's I missed that one. And then it says, oh, you have a little faith. Therefore, do not worry. Do not worry saying, what shall you eat? What shall you drink? And what shall you wear? It's there. For after these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He knows it. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. One more time. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. Stress will kill you. It'll take moments off your life, years off your life. You guys remember the story I, I, I told you about, I don't know, five and a half weeks ago. Forgive me for pulling my pants. Years ago, I worried about that. I don't give a rip anymore. I just. So I, I told you about, you know, that, that about five and a half, six weeks ago, that phone call I got about the dogs I took on, right? I got to tell you something. It stressed me out. I actually told Lisa. At one time, I said, look, I'm going to bend over, and I want you to kick me as hard as you can right in the rump. Because the next time I do this, I want to remember the pain. I took those dogs, and, and they'd had a professional trainer training it, and their time was going to lapse. It's a whole story, okay? Time was going to lapse, and their time was going to run out. They're expensive dogs, and you got to score in the hundreds. And this guy took both dogs and scored in the 80s. So the guy that owned us panicked. He said, can you please help me? And like an idiot, I said, yeah. He brought them to me, and, and I just immediately, I'm starting to stress. Now, dogs in this particular test, if they don't go in the water, take them home. You're done. It's over. So I had to figure out what I was working with. And so I, I headed out to Ben Irvy and I took the dogs out there. And, and I'm going to get them into water and people around looking at me. Unfortunately, a lot of people in this county know who I am. So I got to be careful about not getting angry. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get them into water. And Jill, it's not a long time before. 
I'm in the water and they're on the shore. <laughs> this isn't quite working the way it's supposed to. And I'm like, come here, come here, come here. And I know that they're both having a conversation. You know, he's an idiot, isn't he? I finally walked out of there and a, and a, and a really good dog training trick to get something in the water is you just pick that sucker up and throw it out as far as you can. <laughs> you that don't know me, you think I'm kidding. And you that know me said he probably did it to both of them. Yeah, I did. <laughs> but I stressed out over the whole time. Five and a half to six weeks. It's like I lost my life. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm stressed. I'm worried. I'm not getting any sleep. I got bags under my eyes. Wondering what, you know, this is crazy. What have I done? Had the test yesterday and remember they both scored in the 80s. I had one of them scored 102 and I had the other one score a perfect score. I'm on the way home. Owner got there, took the dogs. I'm on the way home saying hallelujah. I will never do that again. <laughs> So what is materialism? It's a tendency to consider material possessions and physical comfort as more important than spiritual values. It has the ability to destroy your life. Now watch this. Listen to this carefully. When your desire to acquire I'm going to say it again. When your desire to acquire becomes the whole goal of your life, you are on the road to destruction. When all you do is get out of bed so you can acquire more, you're in trouble. I can't say it any more plain than that. The drive to always want more is based on the misconception that having more will make you happier, more important, and more, more secure. That's baloney. All three ideas are untrue. I have a mother-in-law right now, right now as we speak, that wealth to her is being able to have enough, enough oxygen her next breath to stay alive. Possessions only provide temporary happiness. You want to know why? Because things don't ever change. Eventually we become bored with them and then we want newer and we want bigger and we want better versions. It needs to jump higher. It needs to go faster. It's never enough. Has anybody here ever had a quad, a four-wheeler? Right? You don't ever start with the biggest and the baddest, do you? You start with this down here, and then you conquer that. You want bigger, you want bigger, you want bigger. And then before you know it, you break your nose. You break your hand. But at least it was bigger and better, right? I remember there was a day, I, 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 it been many years ago, I won a Harley Davidson. And so I went and bought a Harley Davidson. I brought it home, I put it in the garage, and I love that Harley Davidson. I mean... James Dean didn't have anything on me. A lot of our younger ones just said, who's James Dean? <laughs> so I was out in the garage and I go out to ride it one day and I hear the Holy Spirit in my heart say, you're not riding today. Well, what do you mean I'm not riding today? I bought this. I, this is mine. I said, no, you're not riding today. I, why? Hey, you ever have a conversation with God? Huh? Some of you need to have more conversations with God, don't you? I mean, you have a conversation. You know the, the worst part about having a conversation with God? He never loses. And so I'm having this conversation with God, and I'm saying, well, why can't I write it? He said, because you think more of that heart of Davidson than you do me. I thought, well, I don't think so. He said, oh, I know so. You're not writing it. So I, my lip dropped and I tucked my head and I said, okay, well, can I sit on it? Yeah, you can sit on it. <laughs> this is a true conversation between me and God. I said, well, can I start it up? He said, well, yeah, you can start it up. So I did. In the garage, Harley, 
It echoes from the front of the garage out the back of the garage. The neighborhood did not appreciate this. And I'm fired up. So I'd come out, I'd polish it, I'd wax it, I'd wash it, and then I'd sit on it and I'd do it again. Finally, long story short, there finally came a day when I was going out to sit on, and I thought, you know, I, I, that's not a lot of fun. I think I'm not going to do that today. And so I didn't do it. I was going to go out and polish it again. I thought, no, you know, why am I going to polish it? I can't go anywhere with it. Nobody gets to see it. So I didn't do that. So finally, I said to God, you know, I don't even know if I need this thing. And God said, now you can go write it. You see, when it became less than my relationship with God, then God didn't give a rip whether I got on that bike or not. We just have to make sure that whatever we're into, that God is still the most important thing in our life. Possessions will not make the ultimate difference in our lives. Now listen to this. It's all, Lisa, would you come to the piano, please? It's also a myth that if I get more, I'll become important. Now know this. If you guys are writing something down, you need to write this one down. Self-worth and net worth are not the same. Man, I hope you got that one. Self-worth and net worth are not the same. Your value is not determined by your valuables. I know some people that my wealth would fit in a thimble compared to theirs but I don't want to hang around them because they're mean and they're arrogant. Their net worth is much more than their self-worth. Let me say this and give a bit of caution. Now this is, hang with me. Materialism will lead to greed and greed will kill your seed. Greed will kill your seed. Many of you here today, including me, we have planted into the kingdom of God. And we believe it's going to come back to us in time. And I might add, if you think that you're going to plant money and always get money back, and that's the answer, you, your mind is messed up. You want to know one of the greatest things that God could do for me, Randy Scroggins? It's not give me a million dollars. It's make sure that every one of my kids are saved and on their way to heaven. That, to me, is more than a million dollars. There are some people, you don't want a million dollars. You just want to be healthy again. You just want to be able to breathe right again. You just want to be able to get up without your knees hurting or your back hurting. Quit gauging everything by money, guys. I might add this. There are a lot of Christians who have asked God for huge crops, but continue to plant no seed. Now, I know that's going to hurt somebody's feelings. You're probably going to be mad at me, but don't stay mad long because you'll go to hell. You'll burn and, you know, you don't want to do that. Okay. If you want a huge crop, you've got to plant seed. You don't, go, you don't go outside of your house. I don't care what backyard you got or whatever. You don't go out in your backyard and, and just look at the ground and say, I want corn. Now, that really is something I would do, not because I'm selfish, because I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't do that. I don't know how to do that stuff. I literally at one time asked Lisa if we could get some pickles or a pickle tree, and, it, and I found out that they come from cucumbers. I didn't know that. I just thought you'd go to a tree and pick a pickle. <laughs> I can hear our visitors. He actually admits to that, and other people are saying, oh, you haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> 
if you're going to get a crop, you got to plant seed. And the num all due respect, and the number of seed that some Christians have planted would not return to you a dried up prune. However, we want God to do all these great things for us, but we don't want to plant seed. That's because greed has the ability to kill your seed. You want to know what else kills your seed? Getting jealous of somebody else. Getting jealous of somebody. Well, hey, how come they got so much and I got so little? You just answered your question. Let me tell you what I believe about wealth. Do I believe... Do I believe that a righteous individual who loves God and God can trust them, do I believe they have a right to be wealthy? Oh, you better know it. I actually believe this. Candace, I actually believe this. I believe that God looks at our hearts. He loves us so much. He looks at our hearts and he says, if I give, I'm going to use a million. If I give them a million, it will destroy their life. They will take that money. They will use it for bad things. They will become even more greedy and it will destroy their life. So because I love them so much, I'm going to give them a good living, but I'm not going to give more to them than what they can take care of respectfully towards me. And then I think he looks at other people. Oh, I think he looks at other people and he looks at their heart and he says, my God, look at this. I can bless them with as much as I can. I can bless them and bless them and bless them and bless them. And they'll just keep giving to the kingdom and giving to the kingdom. And that money will never own them. They will own that money. And I'm going to go ahead and bless them in abundance. So somebody says, I want to be wealthy. Then make sure your heart is right. There's a story, a, a book that Leo Tolstoy wrote. And the book was entitled, where I got my big thought, the book was entitled, How Much Land Does a Man Need? Story goes like this, that there was a farmer who had a pretty good sizable farm. But he wasn't satisfied, he wanted more. So the story is that a, another man that was richer than him walked up and said, you see all that land that surrounds your farm? I mean, as far as your eye can see, I own that. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you have it. All you have to do is you have, it's 7 o'clock in the morning now. You're going to have 23 hours. You're going to have 23 hours to come back, 6 o'clock in the morning, and every place you walk around, if you can get back by 6 in the morning, it's yours. However, if you don't get back by 6 in the morning, everything you have is mine. And the man says, not a problem. I'm in good shape. Well, he heads out. He gets past his land, he starts on the other guy's land. And he walks for miles, literally for miles. And all of a sudden, he looks down at his watch and he realizes, uh-oh, I may have gone too far. I don't know if I can get back by six. He starts walking faster back towards home. Then he starts to jog. He looks again, he says, oh, no. I'm not sure I can make this. I'm going to lose everything. So he starts into a dead run. He runs as fast as he can. And just before 6 o'clock, he crosses the finish line. He stands up and says, it's all mine. And with that, he noticed blood was coming out his nose started coming out of his mouth. His heart feels like it's exploding. And within seconds, 
He falls to the ground, dead. How much land does a man need? He gained and yet lost the most important thing, his life. Listen to me, New Beginnings. How much land do you need? How much money do you need? Why are you craving all this other stuff? And your relationship is over here on a shelf somewhere. Greed will kill your seed. Story goes, I close with this. They say that, they say that the hardest animal in the world to catch is a ringtail monkey. People try all the time to catch it and they just can't catch that little thing. It's quick, it swings from the trees, it's this, it's just except one tribe in Africa that boasts that we can catch them at any time we want, as many as we want. Well, some people went over there and they talked to these, this tribe and said, how do you catch so many? And they said, well, it's easy. Here's what you do. You take a bottle, a clear bottle. In that bottle, you put shiny objects. You put a little rope around the bottle, tie it to the ground so they cannot take it away. And then you just stand back. Ringtail monkey comes in and sees the sun, hits the bottle and shiny things begins to glimmer. They can't help themselves. They got to have what's in the bottle. They just can't stay away from it. It's shiny. It looks good. They got to have it. So they walk over, take their hand. The top of the bottle is made in a way they can get their hand in. But the moment they grab the shiny object, they can't get it out. The men simply walk in, put a bag over their head, and while a bag is over their head and their little bodies, their hands still won't come out. Is there a chance that some of us have put our hand in a bottle? We know we need to let go because it's the only way out. But that shiny object, whatever it may be, is so precious that we're willing to take a chance. New beginnings? There's probably some of us need to let go. It's the only way to be delivered. Let go. Just stand to your feet. Father, help us. Help us to realize that the best thing we could ever do is to seek ye first the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. Help us, God, to learn that a relationship with you is the greatest thing that we could ever have. And without a relationship with you, we will never achieve what it is that you want for us. Touch your people, oh God. Touch their hearts and their minds. Touch their attitudes. May we become the people of God that you've asked us to become so that we can change lives in Douglas County. So that when people see us, they don't see us, they see you in us. God, help us 
to become what you have asked us to be. I love you, Lord, with all that I have. Would you repeat this after me, please? Would you just say, Father, in Jesus' name, help me, O oh God, to get my hand out of the bottle, to let go of the very thing that's trapping my hand in the bottle. It's not that important. What I need more than anything else is a relationship with you. So do in my life what you want to do in Jesus' name. Look right here and repeat this after me. Greed will kill my seed. One last thing. I said it before. I'm going to say it again. Jealousy will destroy you. Okay? You don't have to repeat that part. Jealousy will destroy you. All right? It'll take you out. Somebody drives up, they got a new vehicle. Right? Well, bless God, I wish that was mine. You have no idea what that person had to do to get that vehicle. How many years they had to work to get that. Okay? If you want a new, I'm going to use vehicle. If you want a new vehicle, Ron Jill, we've talked this for years. You want a new vehicle, celebrate with them. Corey came in, he's not, oh, there he is right there. Corey came in one day and he had this hot rod that he came in with. I didn't go out there and say, hey, bless God, Corey, I couldn't believe you got that and I didn't. No. You celebrate with them. Congratulations, Corey. Man, I'm proud for you. Now get out of that thing so I can drive it. <laughs> now you celebrate with them. If somebody has something, celebrate with them. If you will genuinely in your heart, not just with your mouth, but in your heart, celebrate with somebody. Hey, guess what? God may have you in line for the very next one. Hallelujah. So don't get so jealous over things. Jealousy will kill you. Greed will kill your seed. Jealousy will destroy you. Okay? Did you learn anything today? Huh? You ready? Keep playing. We're going to do the Lord's Prayer, but keep playing while we're doing the Lord's Prayer. Who wants to lead it? I always lead it. Who wants to lead it? Come on, I know you know it, guys. Who wants to lead the Lord's Prayer? It's your birthday? Here, pass that mic. I don't need you to come up here. Just pass that back there. Don't do it fast. Don't run away with it. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Okay. Our Father, Our Father, which are, keep going, who which art in heaven, hallowed heaven, be, thy, be name. thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. And give, give us this day our daily, daily bread. bread. And, and forgive, forgive us our, our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those as trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, into temptation but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine, thine is the is kingdom, kingdom and, and the power and the glory. And everybody forever. said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.